In this module, we will discuss why we need radiation epidemiology. We know that radiation can cause cancer, so why do we need radiation epidemiology at all today? We know about radiation health effects when the exposures occur all at once or briefly, such as among the atomic bomb survivors. But what we really don't know clearly is what happens when exposure is spread over time and received gradually. For example, all of us, not only radiation workers, are exposed to low doses of radiation every day of our lives. We don't get a one-shot exposure all at once. We get it gradually over time and over our lifespan. What is the risk or the probability that this type of exposure will result in cancer? Is the risk from comparable radiation doses lower, the same, or higher than seen in the Japanese atomic bomb survivor data, which are today the primary basis for radiation standards and protection guidance? Consider these sources of exposure to the public and workers. Medical radiation exposures and diagnostic imaging and treatment. Issues dealing with reactor accidents, such as Fukushima, and the exposures to nearby residents. Terrace events that could occur and we plan for. Some occupations today experience exposures that are not inconsequential, such as fluoroscopy-guided interventionalists and industrial radiographers. Environmental exposures, such as technologically enhanced naturally occurring radioactive material, or T-norm, which is naturally occurring radioactive materials that have been concentrated or exposed as a result of human activities, such as manufacturing, mineral extraction, or water processing. Radon in our homes. Nuclear waste, both high level and low level. Issues for astronauts traveling beyond Earth's orbit are of concern, and the even more relevant exposures are to pilots, air crew, and passengers who are flying higher and more frequently than ever before. We live in a veritable sea of low-level radiation from the environment, in medicine, and in certain occupations. And radiation epidemiology remains a needed cornerstone to understand levels of potential risk and to provide guidance for decision makers and managers who must deal with current and future sources of radiation exposure. Why is there a concern in medical practice? The numbers of CT and medical imaging examinations given in the United States are increasing at a very high rate. There are about 60 million per year just over 10 years ago, and now have reached over 80 million per year. Medical exposures have become the number one source of exposure to the U.S. population, surpassing ubiquitous natural background radiation, which includes radon, cosmic rays, environmental and ingested radioactive substances, such as the radioactive potassium in bananas and other foods. Because of the number of medical imaging exams and the associated dose levels from multiple exams, it's essential to better understand what the magnitude of potential health effects might be, to accurately estimate them and act to minimize the dose to patients and reduce unnecessary imaging. This theoretical future risk is to be balanced with the immediate medical benefit. So assessing risk and finding ways for preventive action in medicine are of critical concern. For this, radiation epidemiology is required. What about radiological accidents and intentional events? After the Fukushima reactor accident, there was wide-scale contamination around that plant and in areas where the winds deposited the radioactive releases. Concerns at the time even included the dispersal of radioactive releases around the world. Small, 
but inconsequential radioactive debris was detected in the United States and other countries. A careful assessment of health risks and projected risks was the realm of radiation epidemiology. What about radiation poisoning and intentional events? The ex-Russian spy who defected to London, Alexander Litvinenko, was poisoned with a drop of polonium-210 in a cup of tea before going to a sushi bar for dinner. He died a horrible and painful death in 25 days. He looked emaciated and as if he was treated with a lethal dose of whole body radiation. Biokinetic models developed in conjunction with epidemiologic studies of polonium workers were used to accurately estimate the amount ingested and doses to specific organs. This is evidence of an intentional use of radiation for harm. Another concern is the widespread contamination that would follow a radiological incident, which would expose populations to elevated levels of radiation for decades or longer. Radiation epidemiology would help estimate the level of risk possible if residents return to their homes and to help inform judgments of return or relocation. It's also important to plan for radiation emergencies before they occur. In January 2018, the state of Hawaii issued a false alert that a nuclear missile, a horrific weapon of mass destruction, was heading their way. Fortunately, the threat of a nuclear weapon detonation was not real, but the public concern was real. Though the probability for such an attack is very small, it is not zero. An improvised nuclear device or a radiological dispersal device, also known as a dirty bomb, could be intentionally detonated on U.S. soil. We plan in the United States for such catastrophic events, including the aftermath. We need good estimates of potential radiation risks faced by the emergency responders, the exposed populations, and the populations returning to contaminated soil afterwards. Now, how about occupational exposures to radiation? There are some occupations in medicine, the interventional fluoroscopists, where relatively high occupational exposures are of concern. How about industrial radiographers? These are the workers who go out in the field and use radioactive sources to test welds and pipelines for integrity. They can receive relatively high amounts of radiation in terms of occupational limits. Some even get close to the limit. Each year, there are reports of worker accidents that result in serious skin lesions, formerly called deterministic effects, and now are called tissue reactions. Interestingly, this is not a male-dominated occupation in that one-third of the industrial radiographers in our epidemiologic studies are female. It may also be surprising to learn that the largest occupational exposed group in the United States today in terms of collective dose are pilots and aircrew. This is because of the large numbers and the doses received. Although individual doses do not exceed limits set for terrestrial workers, the reasons are because they fly higher and more frequently than before and have increased cosmic ray exposures, primarily from neutrons. Assessments of their exposures in flight are to continue. Radiation epidemiology can project risks and provide evaluations needed for informed decisions as to whether interventions should be considered. What about radiation levels around a nuclear power plant and cancer clusters reported from living near nuclear facilities? Are there reasons to be concerned? Epidemiology provides insights. What about radon? It remains an important population exposure we experience in our homes. Recently, 
the highest levels of radon ever detected in U.S. homes were recorded in Pennsylvania, where over 40% of homes were above the Environmental Protection Agency's action guidance. Epidemiology continues to provide improved estimates of risk from home exposures. Our homes shouldn't be health hazards. What about cleaning up the radioactive waste from legacy sites, such as former weapons facilities or uranium and radium processing plants? How clean is clean? How low is low? What is the target level for remediation, for environmental cleanup? The lowest level provides, theoretically, the lowest level of risk, but the cost can be significant, and the actual protection afforded might be minuscule. What guidance can epidemiology provide for the decision makers and managers? Technologically enhanced naturally occurring radioactive materials, or T-norm, is also an issue because of the radioactive elements that accompany oil and gas extraction. What about exposures to radiation in space? The limiting factor for our astronauts going to Mars is radiation. They'll receive the equivalent of one whole body CT exam every two days. It's gonna take them about three years for their mission to go there, explore, and return. And that's a lot of whole body CT exams. And you can imagine that the amount of radiation they'll receive from galactic cosmic rays is substantial and could approach an effective dose of one sievert. In comparison, each year we receive about 2.4 millisieverts from natural background radiation. There is also the concern that women are more susceptible to radiation-induced lung cancer than men. This possibility increases the lifetime risk of radiation-induced cancer and limits the time that women are allowed in space. Radiation epidemiology is attempting to provide answers to the risk from gradual exposures from galactic cosmic rays in humans. The possible effect on brain function and whether there are differences in lung cancer risk following radiation among men and women. To summarize, there are many radiation exposure situations that the public and professionals encounter, and there are important public and individual health decisions to be made regarding managing of these exposures. Radiation epidemiology can provide valuable information in this regard. We need to have the best science to make good radiation protection decisions, set standards, and provide guidance for occupational and environmental exposures, as well as continue to provide accurate and meaningful calculations for ongoing dose reconstruction, or dose estimation, and compensation programs. And let's not leave out the need for radiation professionals radiation epidemiologists, radiation biologists, radiation chemists, professors of radiation at universities, radiation regulators, and more. Having robust radiation health programs in universities can ensure there is a pipeline for radiation professionals to meet our future needs.